This is Rish Outfield, and I'm going to do two, it looks like three pages from A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit does not go forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me, and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth, and turn to happiness. Again the spectre raised a cry, and shook its chain, and wrung its shadowy hands. You are fettered, said Scrooge trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable. But he could see nothing. Jacob, he said imploringly. Oh, Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In my life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing home and weary journeys lie before me. O oh, captive, bound and double-ironed, cried the phantom, not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I, such was I. But you were always a, a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. At this time of the rolling year, the spectre said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the spectre going on at this rate and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I will, said Scrooge. But don't be hard upon me, Jacob. Pray. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A 
chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. You are always a good friend to me, said Scrooge. Thank you. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghosts had done. Is that the chance and hope you mention, Jacob? he demanded, in a faltering voice. It is. I... I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visits, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob, hinted Scrooge. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped, not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant, whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say, Humbug! but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant. <laughs>